Good morning. Welcome to Common Grounds. We're going to get things kicked off in a moment. The orchestra and choir will come out and listen to some songs. The lyrics will be in the hymnal and on the screens, so you can engage in worship however you feel comfortable. And then, after that, Chaplain Hebe Brand will be preaching and proclaiming the good news today. All in all, we'll be here for just about an hour. Of course, if you're joining us online, we're thrilled to have you here with us as well. Wherever you're joining us from, thanks for making Common Grounds a part of your weekend. And we are thrilled to have you as part of the family. If you're in the sanctuary, we want you to know we have a fantastic, safe, and secure children's church and nursery watch care available. There's still time to check them in. With all that being said, we're going to get things started here in just a moment. So please find your seats if you haven't already. And please prayerfully prepare your hearts for worship. Good morning, Common Ground. Good morning. I'm glad that you have braved the the great uh, another snowstorm of this of this year to, to get here to chapel. Uh, I always enjoy the weather, no matter what it is. The uh, last couple of days have been warmer than usual, I think. Uh, but that was that provided for some good good outdoor walking around, even though it was kind of rainy and dreary. But at least it was warmer. It made me made me feel back home more uh, on the coast of Oregon weather than, uh, than normal. So uh, there was a little, maybe a little taste of home for me. So thanks be to God for that, uh, to remind me of that. Uh, if you are new here to Common Ground, this is your first Sunday, you've never been here before, uh, welcome. We are a, a multi-denominational Protestant Christian chapel. Uh, so we have all sorts of, uh, of, of flavors, but we are here ultimately to make much of the, the death, burial, and resurrection uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, we are interested in your spiritual growth. We're interested in uh, your connection to God and your connection to others, and those are some things that are really important to us. We do have a gift for you if this is your first time visiting uh, us today uh, to just say thank you for being part of our family. Uh, a little bit of, of like some information in there, and in that there's a card if you want to fill that out. Uh, we'd love to have lunch with you, have a cup of coffee, a uh, phone call. Uh, just to kind of talk about uh, what we are all about and how you may be able to plug in uh, to Common Ground. Uh, if, if you're sitting out in the pew and God has been working on your heart, because I did, I've been saying that you all are ministers of the gospel. It's not just those of us who are chaplains, um, but you are charged with making disciples. God has charged you with that. The, the Great Commission in the end of Matthew is for you sitting in the pew, not just for me as uh, the preacher or uh, one of the other chaplains, just because we are in professional ministry mode. You are in ministry. God has called you to the ministry, each and every one of you. Um, wherever you are going, you're supposed to be teaching things about Christ, making disciples, and hopefully baptizing them. I think on the, the 26th, we have baptism on the 26th of February, uh, we are going to hopefully fill up the baptismal here. Uh, somebody wants to get baptized. So if, you, if you've never been baptized, and that's something that you're interested in, uh, what a great opportunity to do that before the, the whole family of God uh, in that. So that's something you're interested in. Just get with me or so, one of the others, uh, and, and we'll baptize you here uh, with some other people. So that's something that you haven't fulfilled, fully committed yourself in obedience to Christ to be baptized, uh, we'll give you an opportunity uh, to do that that Sunday. A couple other things that are coming up. Uh, Lent is going to be upon us shortly. One of the things I'd, I'd like to do uh, is, is have a, a Lenten Bible study on Thursdays uh, during lunchtime. We'll be at the Family Life Ministry Center. Um, uh, so some of you may do the fasting for Lent. A lot, a lot of people do not, but some people do. And so we'll have uh, some soup and bread uh, and we'll go through, I think the, the book of James is the one I'm going to be doing, uh, just talking about wisdom and uh, leading up to the celebration of, the, of Christ's resurrection. Uh, that's one thing that we're looking at, at doing. And then also on, on Thursday nights, the choir meets and they practice their, their songs. Uh, and we, in the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, providing dinner for them, but it's a little bit late. It's like at 1900. 
Uh, but if you're interested in, uh, I want to be doing also a Bible study while they're doing that. So uh, if your spouse wants to be part of the choir, and you can come in and be part of the Bible study on Thursday night, uh, we'll do that over at the, the Family Life Center too as well. Um, there's another option, another availability to get together uh, just to build community, because I think that's kind of what we need here in Common Ground is to build community. And if you're feeling led to have a small group at your house, I want to empower you to do that um, in the name uh, of discipleship, because that's what you're called to do. Uh, so if you feel a certain way that God is calling you to go and do that, um, chalk with me, and I want to empower you to do what God is calling you to do, uh, using the gifts uh, for the for the future of the kingdom. Uh, one other announcement, and I you're like, it's got to get on with the on with the program. Uh, all the I think all the the auxiliary. Um, uh, are back again this week, whether it's Club Beyond, uh, PWC is an operation, the Korean, Korean Women of the Chapel are also an operation, um, the Protestant Women of the Chapel, uh, they do have a, a retreat coming up at the beginning of March, and so shortly they'll be opening up registration for that. If you're part of this congregation, we're gonna, gonna help fund uh, a portion of that. There's a, there's a certain amount of fee that you have to pay, and then common ground is going to pick up uh, the rest of the tab for you to go in on that so if you're a soldier a, a uniform service member uh woman and would like to go on that just be pay attention to the to the facebook page on on pwc to know when that registration is open so that you can get to go to that they're going up to the dragon hill lodge uh last year it was a wonderful time to gather together uh to pray and to see what god has for growth uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of great things happened this last year, and so they're looking to do it again uh, at the beginning of of March, and so that's available uh, to you as well. Uh, and that's all that I'm going to say about all the things that I'm going to announce. So, with that, I'll let you go. All right. Good morning, church. Um, continue to worship our Lord. Please stand for the call to worship. Let us stand. And let us pray together. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord and peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, behold, your King is coming to you. And Father, we praise your name and for imperfect and faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things and planned long ago. And Father, this morning we call your faithfulness. Thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us each moment, Lord. And Father, we come to you and lay our lives before you this morning, worship you in spirit and truth. May everything within us cry, Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Pray it all is in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Please join me in singing Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Hymn number three. <laughs> Darkness hide thee, cast the eye of 
Turn to him 356, redeemed. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Please join me in prayer for offering. Let us pray. And Father God, we thank you that you give the gift of abundance, eternal life. Your generosity always overflows us. May everything we have is a gift from you, Lord. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessing that you have given to us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, power and strength be unto you 
our God forever and ever. Amen. Stand for the doxology. this time as we are remaining standing would you please okay, greet one another okay and then um yeah say happy new year again um yeah let's just continue to do so <laughs> wonderful a celebration again again welcome all right this time okay this is time for prayer okay why don't we um yeah let's about a minute or so uh let's go to god and the solemn prayer together and then at the end then i'm going to lead her in prayer let us pray and then, father thank you so much for uh, the worship and thank you so much for the uh, that you have done for us
Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Father, we thank you for the truth. We thank you for the word, and thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the scripture that it leaves, it speaks, it moves, and Lord, we are there. And Father, we thank you for our time this morning. How wonderful, wonderfully rich and blessed that we have been, Lord. And what a joyful celebration that we are in again, Lord. And Father, we thank you. Thank you for the, the work of the Holy Spirit that's done here by faith. Lord, we ask that you will make us the people of prayer and people of mutual love and a people who love and sit under your word and a people who live and move and have our being in the free grace that you provided. And Father, this morning, we want to gather our hearts and pray and pray for peace of this world. And Father God, would you please bring healing and peace for those who are afflicted Peace among nations and peace in their dwellings, peace in their hearts through our Lord, our Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, hear our prayers. It is our gift and privilege to come into your house and cry out to you our worries and our burdens are life. Lord, please come to us. Intervene into our lives. Embrace all our life problems with your warm arms and strengthen us again with your faith and power. And Father, we thank you for sending us your Son, Jesus Christ, on a glorious night to be born a virgin, to live a perfect life, and to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you that he rose from the dead three days later, and every day, every moment, we can celebrate the gift of eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you grant us peace, peace in our homes, peace in our congregation, in our church, in our hearts, and help us stay focused on you always. And Father, we are here to worship you. We want to worship in spirit and truth. And Chaplain Hebrew Brandon proclaimed the word this morning. We pray that you will search our hearts, that we might not be those who simply hear these words, but we want to embrace you, our Lord Christ, and embrace the authority of your word in our lives. Lord, let's continue to bless us in this worship. Let's continue to pray with the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil one, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
dismissed to youth service. Again, church, our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. This can be found on page 949 of your pew Bibles and also on the overhead behind me. So if you're able, uh, please stand for the reading of God's word. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 15. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God, the Father for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Thank you. Well, it has been a while since we've been in the book of Ephesians. Uh, kind of we took a pause for the uh, Christmas Advent season to talk much about Jesus. And although in Ephesians we make much about Jesus as well, uh, some of you may not be uh, caught up to speed uh, in Ephesians. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time in my run-up introduction because that would take uh, a long, long time. Uh, but I will say that Ephesians is really about identity, your identity in Christ, uh, living for him fully. Holiness is not something that, that is a, a, an accident, but it is a daily choosing to either obey the word of the Lord, obey Christ and the Holy Spirit that is within you, uh, or to do what you want to do and, and decide that you are king of your own life and can do what you want. And there's a, there's a fight in that. I think Paul talks a little bit about if you are a believer, if you have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved, and you are, uh, then you are responsible to act like a child of God. There is no, uh, there's no gray area in that. You are called to be holy. You are called to be uh, like God, right? That's chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, if you are a Christian, then you bear the name uh, of the family of God and are his child and you must act like it. You must think like it. You must do things like it. Uh, very often I think we, we get in, uh, often in a a bind when we try to say that that works do not save you and I am I am totally with you on that and so we'll say stuff like Christianity is not about you know the do's and do nots it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ and this is true that's what that's what brings you into a, a, a covenant relationship with God the Father is through Christ Jesus his death burial and resurrection on the cross and you become a family member of his he is the one who washes you and cleanses you and gives you a new heart and a new family and all the stuff that's promised in Ephesians chapter 1 this is who you are in Christ uh, but that does not stop the do's and the do nots from appearing in the scripture uh, there are over 630 uh, commands in the New Testament for believers in Christ. That's a lot. That's a lot. And I can't just wish them away and say, well, you know, that's, that's God uh, telling me I need to live this holy life and that the Bible says I can't do it and that's why I need, why I need Jesus. All right? And on, on one hand, that is true. You can't do it. And that's why you need Jesus Christ in your life to, be, to bring salvation I can't just go, well, I'm only human. Because the command, Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. And God's grace, not only does God's grace uh, give you the, the ability to be part of his family, but God's grace is empowering you, right? You have, the, 
You have the Holy Spirit that lives inside you to help you obey the Word of God. So some of the stuff I'm going to say in here, uh, it, as we, as we kind of move into these lists, I just have to, remember, have to remind myself, and hopefully you remind yourself, that this is not just, these aren't just suggestions. These aren't just like, uh, do them if you can, because you're only human. Uh, that mindset, you need to toss that out and go, God is calling us to do these things. Paul is speaking under the authority of the Holy Spirit with commands to tell us how we should live our life in light of what Jesus has done. Okay, so we're not living our life this way in order, uh, in order to gain salvation that's already been provided free of charge. You, can, you read that in, in Ephesians chapter 2, right? So that no one may boast. But now that you're in the family of God, your identity, uh, you should be able, uh, people should be able to know who you are. They should know who your father is by the way that you talk and the way that you do things and the way that you, the way that you think. And that's really kind of what leads, lead, leading us up to Ephesians chapter 5 kind of where we're at. Um, we're going to have kind of two parts. The, this, today, uh, uh, I'm going to run through a couple of the, the commands uh, that are there and kind of briefly talk a little bit about them. And I'm going to camp out predominantly uh, on the one command that says, do not be drunk on, on wine. And then next week, I'm going to camp out on the positive side where he says, do not be drunk on wine, but be filled uh, with the, the Holy Spirit. And so next week, I'm going to talk a lot about what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what does it mean not to be drunk with wine. And I'm going to, it's slightly topical in a way that I'm going to look at some passages of Scripture that talk about alcohol and, and, what, are, uh, and what are maybe a Christian way of looking at it uh, and how we integrate that maybe into our, into our own life. Uh, but before we, before we get there, some things of, of background. I... I wrote these two names, the, uh, Artemis and, and Bracchus, or Dionysus. Um, that really wasn't supposed to be on the slide. That was something I was holding in place, and I forgot to get rid of them. The, the two major gods in Ephesus, uh, one was, uh, uh, was Artemis. Uh, she's the goddess of, of the, the hunt. She's the goddess of fertility. Um, and then Ephesus was like one of her main, her main centers. And so a lot of the stuff that, that Paul is talking about um, is kind of talking, uh, uh, not against, against her as the Greek goddess, but how people acted in response to the worship of her. And so if you're a Christian, you're like, well, can I still do, what well, came out of this, uh, I was worshiping Artemis, or I was uh, worshiping Dionysus, or, or Bacchus, depending on where you were from, I guess. Um, can I still worship them? Can I still participate in some of the festivities and the festivals and the stuff that comes along with worshiping that? I've come out of that life and now I've decided that, that Christ is uh, the true God to worship. Can I, can I belong to those and still do those things? And Paul's like, mostly no, you cannot, right? You can't, you can't worship two gods. You, have to, you choose, choose the God whom today you will serve, right? So a lot of it's coming of that. Um, so Dionysus is the god uh, of wine, like that's really the, a big portion, which is probably why he says do not get drunk with wine, uh, because in one of the celebrations that comes along with that is you drink a lot uh, and you get as passed out drunk as you possibly can uh, to celebrate, you know, the awesomeness that alcohol is. Yeah, so that's, it's in the background. As you're reading that, that's probably why he's going after that and said, he says instead, be fill, instead of being yourself filled with wine, be filled with the Spirit. And so that's probably, that's why those, those two things are up there. All right. Let's move to the first command that, that pops up in here. This is in verse 15. It says, look carefully. I've underlined it for you on the, on the screen so you kind of know where the, uh, I guess, where the commands are in that. So it's look carefully. That's got a command to you to, to think about the things that are going on in your own life. You are being called continuously to evaluate yourself. Am I living like Christ wants me to? Am I living in the way that pleases God? Am I living in a way that, that's in recognition to, the what, to what God has done for me? If I have a new heart and a new mind and a new family, it, would, would people recognize that? Right? You can kind of tell where people are by listening to their accent. You can tell kind of where they're from, or at least what household they grew up in, uh, a little bit by their accent. Right? You should have a Christian accent on your life. People should hear it and go, 
I bet that person goes to church. I bet they believe in Jesus. Because of the things that you say and the things that you do, there's an accent. And, he's, and I think this is what Paul is talking about. Look carefully at then how you walk. Walking is not just like the, the gait that you, that you do, okay? The Bible's talking about what is, it, uh, what is it you're all about? Look at the time that you spend doing things. What is it? Uh, would, would you be able to, and this is for you. Again, I, I, wanna, I don't want you to be looking around the room and be like, well, let me inspect everybody else. I, first, this is you. Look at yourself. Evaluate yourself for this. Uh, is my life oriented around worshiping Christ in all the things that I do? In all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's the first greatest commandment that Christ says is to love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, would you be able to look at yourself in your heart and say, is that true? Right? And I'm, I'm not saying that that's how many times you go to church or how many times you do a Bible study or how often you pray. Uh, that's, some of that's between you and God, and there are commands to do those things, and I hope it is. Uh, but is your life oriented in a way and if you have kids, do your, do your kids know that you, that you care passionately uh, about following Jesus and worshiping him? Will they be able to pick that up by watching you do the things that you do and investing in the time that you invest in? Would they know that Christ is important to you? Right? That's why he's saying, be careful then, look carefully, examine yourself on how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And, and in Ephesians, wise is always... Uh, in alignment with what God is doing for us, right? So there's wisdom uh, in following God and doing the things that God has called us to do, or you can be foolish and not do those things. That's really, those are the two uh, categories. The second command in verse 17 says, therefore, um, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Uh, in a sense, don't waste your life. Time is short. You don't have very much, you don't have very long on this earth to live for God fully. You, you, you may not get tomorrow uh, the, the, the one parable of the rich fool. I don't know if you ever read that to your kid. It's like as a little ditty to it in one of those golden arch books. I know I'm really dating myself when I say that. Really, really dating myself. Um, but the rich fool, uh, I wish I could sing the little ditty to you, but if I memorize. But he, always said, he would always say something about, I, I will live for God another day, but today I will live for me. And then he dies that night. It was kind of a terrifying book. He dies that night, you know. And, and then the, the point of the book was he's reading the kids be like, are you living for Jesus? And, you know, as a six-year-old child listening to that, like, what if I die tonight? Will I live for Jesus today? But that, I think that question is still, is still the same. Don't, don't, don't be foolish. God is coming back. God is coming back. Christ is coming back. And you will be held account for all the things that you say, think, and do. Now, as a Christian, you're like, what does that, what does that mean as a, as a believer in Christ? Well, I think that's another, probably another sermon for another day. And I know my wife says, stop saying those things. But I think that's true, right? But you are going to be held accountable. You're going to be held accountable for the things that you do. Therefore, don't waste, don't waste your life in pursuing things that will die at the end when Christ comes back. Do the things, invest in things, uh, that, that build the kingdom. Invest in things that will remain when Christ returns. Do the things that, that, that will honor God when he returns, that you won't be ashamed to stand before him and say that you, you spent your time doing. Do the things that will please God. And that's, that's this command here. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And, and kind of what is, what is the will uh, of, of your life? Right? Back in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, it says, um, For we are his workmanships, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has, God has called us to do the things that, that he's asking us to do here. These aren't just random things. He's planned for us to walk in them. So do it. That's the will of God. People are like, well, what is God's will? Right? To do the good works he's calling you to do. Well, what is the good works? You can go back up into chapter, uh, chapter 4, right at the end there, uh, verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. If you need a place to start, start there. That's a great place to begin. What are the good works? Don't waste your life doing mean things to people. Don't waste your life holding on to a grudge for people. Why? Because Christ has forgiven you. And Christ is going to forgive that person too. And if, if you think you, if you, 
if you think your wrath is better than God's wrath or your justice is better than God's justice, you're, you're in the wrong. And you need to repent of that. Right? Start in the good works. Don't waste your life. And I think part of the don't waste your life then is this next as he goes into verse 18. It says, do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So this is a command to not get drunk uh, with, with wine. And um, there's really no way around it. That's a command. Do not get drunk with wine. Now you're asking me, what is, what is drunkenness? What does that mean? How much, how much intoxicated can I be before I cross over the line and I'm no longer uh, obeying the word of God? Uh, I'm not going to give you a, a, a number of standard drinks, okay? Uh, there's some wisdom guidelines that I'm going to try to provide you based off of scripture passages, uh, and that way you can work them into your own life. Um, if you are, if you are uh, uh, alcohol dependent, all right, if you are dependent on alcohol on some level, um, my best advice to you as a counselor is to, to never drink again. That's, that's my best uh, pushing out there. Never, never drink again. It just, it, it'll go better for you. In fact, if, um, if some of that stuff out of people's lives, a significant portion of the people that come and see me wouldn't need to come and see me because of the destruction that has happened uh, in their lives because they got too dependent on the use of alcohol to do different things. And so I say that with all seriousness. Um, and I kind of, I'm a little nervous talking about alcohol on some levels. One, it's very prevalent in our culture, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force. Like it's very, it's, it's part of our culture. Right? And the Marines, I don't want to leave them out. Like it's a very big portion of our, our culture. So I'm partly nervous because I, I don't want to, one, take away uh, a gift that God has provided you to enjoy life. And I'm going to cover that. And if you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense what you just said, it will, hopefully, after I talk about the positive verses that, that the scripture talks about alcohol and the way it does. But I also don't want to give you license to do whatever you want because that's obviously not what the Bible teaches either. So I'm kind of, I'm in a, I'm in a hard place. So some of you who are, who are, I would call teetotalers and never drink and think that's the worst thing in the world, uh, you're going to be mad at me for talking positively about alcohol. And some of those of you who, who like alcohol a lot more maybe than you should, it's going to sound like I'm, I'm anti-alcohol, and I'm not going to be able to split the difference. Okay? I just know that. Um, but a little bit about my background growing up before I get into some of these verses and, and um, the importance of it. The first time I, I, I ordered an alcoholic drink, I was in my 30s, okay? So my, my mom and dad did not drink. They were, they were teetotalers. They never, they never said, like, if you drink it, you're, you're, it's part of Satan's brew and that you're going to, to go to hell and Christians should never drink. They were never like that. But denominationally, the same one that backs me up now, uh, if you were a, uh, a chaplain or a, or a pastor in that, uh, you had to sign something that you would never drink alcohol and taste that. Um, about 25 or so years ago, maybe 30, uh, my denomination changed their stance. I think all the old, old people died off, uh, and they had some newer people, and they, they were like looking around at each other, and they're like, well, either we pretend that we're not drinking alcohol, uh, or we need to realign ourselves with what maybe scripture teaches that. Um, so alcohol is not a thing in my life. Uh, if I never have to drink ever again, that would be so too easy for me. Okay, so I know this is not an area of my own weakness. In fact, I, if I have one glass of wine, uh, I don't like the way it makes me feel. Alcohol does not make me happy. Like it does some people, they really enjoy, they enjoy alcohol for some good reason. But it doesn't do me. So I, I want to just put that out front, that you know where I'm coming from at least. Uh, it doesn't do anything for me, and I don't like the way it makes me feel. But that being said, I, I do want to talk about what the Bible says about it so that we have a more biblical understanding. So when Paul says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, it, it'll make a lot more sense maybe next week as we cover it um, from here. And I have a lot of passages and probably little time. The first, the first one I want you to think about, again, I'm going to go the positive route right now, but I'll go positive and then I'll go a little bit on the negative side and, and warnings. In Genesis chapter 14, there's a story of um, Abram. He, hasn't, he wasn't called Abraham yet, but Abram 
right? Lot, Lot gets stolen. The, 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 um, a bunch of kings came down, ransacked Sodom, where, where Lot was staying, carried Lot away, and Abram was like, you know what? I got to save my, my nephew. So he gathers his men around himself, and he goes and he attacks uh, the kings that, that did some stuff, and he, and he grabs them, and he brings them back. And there's this character called Melchizedek comes out, right? And Melchizedek uh, is... Uh, in the New Testament, a, a type of Jesus. Like there's a, there's all, it's only positive. Anything that says about Melchizedek, and that's really almost, you know, the king of Salem brought out bread and wine. And this word for wine, and the reason I mention that is because those are some symbols of something that we do on the first Sunday of the month, right? We're called communion. We use bread and we use wine. Now in here, we use a lot of people who drink grape juice, right? I've been trying to incorporate some more wine options for people that, that want to do that. Um, but this word for wine is not, is not just grape juice. Okay, there is a word for that in the Bible, uh, and this is not it. There's a word for alcoholic beverage that comes from grapes. Okay? Uh, my tradition tries, to, uh, several people in my tradition will, will try to say that um, every time the word wine is mentioned, it's really just grape juice w with some bubbly in it. And that's just not, that's not true. That's wishful thinking and wanting to wanting the, the desire because alcohol is, causes lots of problems. The desire is good, I think, is trying to distance themselves from that. But that's not what the scripture teaches. And I would challenge you, to, if, the, if that's your belief system, I'd challenge you to, to go back and actually be honest with yourself and look at some of the way the words are described and tell me um, that, that they didn't know how to make alcohol back then. Okay. I, they probably knew how to make it better almost than, than, than we do here because they had nothing better to do. Right? They, didn't have, they didn't have Facebook to flip through. They, they were like, what are we doing? I don't know. Let's set this vat of, of grape juice and sit it around and see what happens to it. That's, I think that's, you look at Noah, the first, one of the first things he did, come off the, come off the ark, what did he do? He planted a vineyard. Right? So that's early, early on in human system. But here is the king of Salem, Melchizedek, this type of Christ coming out. And he, he brings out bread and wine in celebration of, of Abram's win. And what is Abram's response? If you look at this, Abram's response to this is to give him a tithe, a tenth of everything uh, that he brought back. So it's a, a very positive message about uh, there's nothing negative uh, about here, but there's a celebration. And since Melchizedek is like this, this Christ-like figure, and he throws a party for Abram or Abraham, if you're into that. All right, Genesis chapter, tw chapter 27. Um, this, is, this is Isaac blessing his son Jacob. Now, Jacob is, is stealing the blessing from Esau in, in Genesis chapter 27, but this is what Isaac says to Jacob, who he thinks he's blessing Esau, but that's another story. May God give you the dew of heaven and the, f and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. There's something about, about wine as the produce. Uh, that means there's plenty in God's blessing. Uh, a lot of times in the scriptures, wine, and you're going to see, wine is this, this future thing, this blessing that God is, is demonstrating. God has given it uh, for in, enjoyment. God has given it to us for future things. So when you're drinking wine, like you should be thinking of heaven. Like there's, uh, and the promised land that is to come. That is kind of one of the emphasis, and you'll, you'll see some of these passages kind of go into that. But that's the blessing that, uh, that Isaac gives his, uh, his son Jacob. May God give you plenty of grain and plenty of wine. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 7, verse 13. Um, he will, this is talking again about God. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your wine and your oil, the increase of your herds, the younger your flock, and the land that he swore your fathers to give you. Uh, there's something about, again, about wine. There's something about this, this having plenty, that you're at peace, that you have time to make wine. And it's, it's a, a sign of, again, blessing. Nothing negative about that in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Um, <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter uh, 14. This is talking about the tithe. If you read the whole thing, I don't have time to read the, all, all, the, all the part about Deuteronomy, but this is a tithe. Uh, he says, uh, once a year, you're supposed to 
uh, give, up a, give up a tenth of, of some stuff and to celebrate with it, not just give it to the Levites and take care of them, uh, but to celebrate the bounty that God has given you. And, and in this particular passage, he goes, if you can't make it, wherever God told you to go celebrate with your tithe, to go celebrate, if you, if you can't take all your stuff with you, you're supposed to sell it and take that money and then go to that place where you're supposed to go and have a party. He said, spend that money for whatever you desire. This is a Thanksgiving feast. Whatever you desire, oxen, sheep, wine, strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before Yahweh your God, the Lord your God, and rejoice, you and your household. There's something about a party that was going to happen uh, of the tithe, and part of that was, uh, was the wine. Drink what you want in front of the Lord in celebration for all the blessings that he's given you in your life. Whatever your appetite craves, the first Thanksgiving, right before we even called the Thanksgiving in the U.S. Now, you're like, well, is there, is there some temperance in there? We're going to get there, okay? For those of you who are uncomfortable right now with me talking so positively about alcohol, um, it's supposed to look forward to something, the blessing of God. It's supposed to do something for us. It was given to us by God uh, in a particular way for a particular thing. Uh, and he says, rejoice. And if it was evil, I guarantee you God would not say celebrate in this way if it was completely evil in the way. Just know that Satan likes to, likes to pervert things always. Um, here's another Psalm 104. Uh, talking about um, being appreciative of what God has given us. This is a praise to God. It says, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and the plants of man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen a man's heart. What was wine there for? A giving praise and honor to God that, that, that wine is provided to gladden the heart of man. It's not grape juice that's gladdening the heart of man. Okay, this is, that's another word for alcoholic drink. Praise God that there's something that we can drink that lightens our heart, lightens our mood, and can give God maybe praise, honor, and glory. You're like, but there's a but coming. There, there will be. I'll skip. There's Proverbs 3. You can read, you can read that. That says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your produce, and your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. God will bless you. Wine is a sign of, of blessing. Um, Proverbs 9. Come, this is wisdom. Come, eat my bread and drink the wine I have mixed. Wisdom. This is the personification of, of wisdom. Come and do the things that I'm calling you to do. Celebrate. It, again, if, if, this, if, if wine were so evil, um, God would not call you in wisdom to come and partake. Um, in, into Isaiah, um, it says, On this mountain of the Lord will hosts will make all peoples a feast rich of food, a feast of well-aged wine of rich food, of, of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. He, he, he thinks such a celebration of the future things to come when we're all gathered together in the kingdom, he mentions wine twice, right? And it should not surprise us, like the, the new covenant, the sign of the new covenant is bread and wine. That's the sign of the new covenant. Wine is to make us think of future things. But again... Humans like to take the things that God has provided and do terrible things with that. Um, same thing in Amos. You can read in Joel uh, other positive things that we have to say about alcohol. I'm going to run out of my time if I don't get to some negative verses, though. But I wanted to hit you with lots of positive ones. There's a, and there's more, right? We could flip through some of these. There's more. And then I'll, I'll end with, uh, at least with the positive, in the one that every, that every drunkard likes to quote in the Gospel of John. Uh, I heard a preacher preaching on this, and he goes, there's one passage in all the Scripture that every, every person who loves alcohol can, can quote you. They don't know where they find it, but they know the story, and that's when Jesus turned water into wine. Okay? Jesus did not turn water into grape juice. It, that's not what he's talking about. The, the way the Greek is laid out, the way the, the master of the feast says, like, most people get everybody kind of happy at the beginning with bad wine and then they or with the good wine then they keep they 
make it cheaper and cheaper as the, as the day goes on because you can't tell the difference. He goes, but you've saved the best for last. Now, they're going to say, what is the point of all this? And they're going to say, well, Jesus really wants you to drink alcohol and party. And that's a lot of times how people use this passage. And if that's your interpretation, if that's what you hear me saying, then that's not what I'm saying at all. Okay, do not use this passage to say, well, the preacher said, Jesus said, I should drink alcohol. No, that's not. This is a sign of the new covenant. This is the first sign that Jesus does to show that he is truly God and that he can bring about the change that he is preaching to the people. Right? This is the first sign about, uh, about future things. It's a connection of, of heaven. It's a connection of, of the, the goodness that will, that will flow when we're all together. Right? And I, so I think if you're looking throughout a, a, a reason uh, for drinking alcohol is that celebrations... Where, where your heart can be glad for those things. But here comes, here comes some of the buts. One is, I have this passage here in Ephesians that says, do not be drunk with wine. How do I, how do I balance between those two things? I don't know if, if at that party, that wedding in Cana, um, if how much what that drunkenness looked like. But I do know how much is too much to drink to get to this drunken pace. Well, there's some, pro- there's some proverbs I think that would be uh, important. Um, it says, wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. There are people who, who love alcohol a little bit too much. It's beyond just celebrating things that, of, of God's plenty in your life. It's, I have to drink one to go to bed. I have to drink one to talk to my wife or to my husband. I have to drink one to get away from my, to get away from my kids. In fact, I can't, I can't relax at all unless I have a, a glass of wine. And I guarantee you, if that's your mindset, it's not in praise, honor, and glory of God. Right? If, if, you're, if you're not drinking because you're, you're happy and it's forcing you to think about future things and, and, it's, it's fill it, and there's something that you're probably crossing over into the do not be drunk with wine portion. I don't know how many that is for you. I don't know how many that is for you. Uh, another Proverbs says, who has woe, who has sorrow? This is Proverbs 23. Who has strife, who has complaining, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes, those who tarry long over wine, those who try to mix uh, wine alone. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. There's something about alcohol that kind of turns your mind off. In Ephesians, it says that we're supposed to be, we're renewing our minds, right? That, that we have to, with our minds, we are, we are holding ourselves captive, and alcohol kind of turns off that portion. And goodness usually does not flow with much wine. Very rarely does somebody drink a lot. Um, at, the, at the very beginning of the stage, they'll be like, Chapman, I love you so much, Right? But as the night goes on, it's going to pass from that phase to them being just vulgar, typically. This, the badness starts to come out of us because that's our natural state. And our mind is, is we're battling ourselves every day. That's why we have to take off those dirty clothes and put on new clothes on a daily basis. Because Romans chapter 7, if you know what I'm talking about, read Romans chapter 7. That truth is still there. I struggle with the things that I don't want to do. I continue to do them right? I struggle with that. I know what Christ has called me to do. I struggle with this in this, in this life, and I'm, I'm daily trying to put that under control. But I have Romans chapter 8, which is also true, which is, who has freed me from this body of sin? Well, it's Christ Jesus who can separate me from the love of God. Nobody can. God loves me completely and fully, right? So I have these two passages that are the same. It's a Romans passage. But like, who, who, has, who has woe, who has sorrow? If alcohol brings you sorrow in your life, in your relationship, then you're, you're sinning. If, if alcohol brings sorrow into your relationship, then you need to stop because it's bringing strife. And, and as a child of God, you are to be full of peace and connection. If it's not, then you're sinning. Isaiah 5 says, Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink. I know that's a big thing in our, our culture. How much can you drink? You're only a man as much as you can hold your liquor. It's taught to us in movies. It's taught to us on the other side. If you get, if you get 
uh, a little tipsy with one glass of wine or, or a beer, you get mocked and you get laughed at. I'm, I'm telling you, that's probably a good thing for you. Right? Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine in Isaiah. Which, by the way, when we get done with our Ephesians passage, we're going to move into the book of Isaiah. I'm going to, we're going to be preaching through that. That's our next, our next thing. Uh, Galatians 5. I know you're like, I know we've got to go. Galatians 5, it says, <laughs> Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. In fact, if you read the whole passage, which may be a, a better thing to do. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There are going to be people in hell they are, because they've chosen the drink rather than to be filled with the Spirit. Drunkenness is in this long list of things that, that we are not supposed to. And he says that's among them. There's probably a lot larger list of, of things that are disqualifying you from the kingdom of heaven. And alcohol is one of those things. So if, if again, if none of those positive passages create a, a desire to worship God more and create peace and harmony with, with you, your neighbor, and your family, uh, then you're probably crossing over into this area where you are abusing alcohol. And the Bible says not only just don't do it, but it is a sin in your life. Isaiah 5, Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink and who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. Not just, not just sadder them, woe to them. Woe to them. Curses. Woe to them. If you're, if you're a leader in the church, First Timothy sucks about as an overseer or as an a deacon. Uh, both of them say, do not be addicted to much wine or sober-minded, self-controlled, not a drunkard. One of the things that, that older women in Titus are supposed to, <laughs> supposed to be teaching other, other women not to do, uh, one is, as an older woman, so this is just for, not to be slaves to much wine. It's Titus 2. So what am I trying to say? I guess ultimately in all these things. So these are, those are just but like a small smattering. And so now you're kind of caught between two places. Being a Christian, there's a lot of wisdom, that, wisdom that's, inv uh, that's involved in that. That's part of why you need the dwell and dwelling of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of wisdom. Can you drink? I don't know. Can you? That's my question to you. Are you going to be able, how much alcohol can you have? Well, I, I know not to be drunk. And drunkenness usually means I, I'm starting to do things that I wouldn't ordinarily do if I wasn't under the influence of something. A, am I still able to love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength and love my neighbor as myself if I'm under the influence at all? If you, can't, if you answer no to that, then you need to, to stop because you've crossed over that whatever that line is and you need to repent because that was a sin. Is it something that you use again, like at a wedding or a festival or a celebration, and it, and it helps everybody give praise, honor, and glory to God, then you're probably on the, on the okay side. And that's, probably, that's why Paul says you need to look uh, carefully then how you should walk, not as, wise, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, knowing that the days are evil. Now, I don't know if I've given you any clear guidance at all on that. I felt like kind of maybe it's kind of squishy, You'll understand a little bit more next week as we talk about being filled with the Spirit and why, how that's different than being filled with wine. Because if you're filled with wine, you're not going to be able to do the things that you're supposed to be if you're filled with the Spirit. God has provided alcohol to point to future things, a, a greater future uh, where all humanity is together at peace, living with God. It's part of the sign of the new covenant. And so Satan wants nothing more than to destroy that sign and pervert it. And the more drinks that you have, the more perversion it gets. And I don't know where that line is for intoxication and drunkenness for you. But you need to look carefully in how you, how you use it. And again, if it's, not, if it's not honoring God in the way you use it, then it's better to cut it out of your life. Jesus said, if my right... If my eye causes me to sin, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to take it out. 
if my hand causes me to sin, I'm supposed to cut it off. If that's you and alcohol, then you need to cut it off. Better, better to, to never have that uh, as an option than to burn in hell because you'd rather choose that than following Jesus. Look carefully, then, how you should walk. Let us pray. Richard Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for your word. You provided guidance. Uh, you provided alcohol for us to, to enjoy and to use for our benefit, to, to lighten our heart, to remind us of the future things that are, that are to come. But God, I know that, that humans, because the days are evil, we, we, we perverse it. And so if you've placed uh, boundaries for us on how we, should use, how we should use alcohol, God, I pray for wisdom. That the people that are in here, that they would be wise in how they go about teaching their children about it. May they be wise in how they use it. May they be wise in how they uh, interact with, with their friends and the people. We have a very strong culture that drinking uh, in, in the military. And so I pray that we are lights to those people, that we use it correctly and in wisdom. But in all things, God, may we love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves under the direction of the Holy Spirit, always. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join me in singing and praising the Lord in spirit of the living God. 389. for some coffee and donuts in the back and some fellowship after the benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Be gracious unto thee. 
the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May you go to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Look in the ways that you, that you should walk, that you be found to be fully in align with what the scriptures teach. Go to represent God as his child. Amen.